and welcome to Confessors of Christ Church online community Bible study. This is week number nine, week number nine of our series. And today we're going to be looking at God is perfect. We are now diving deep into the attributes of God. And so this is going to be a fantastic week to jump into. It's one thing to understand that God is real. But we are actually called to know the living God. And we know God by seeing who he is as he has revealed himself through his word and through the scriptures. Which is why it is so important for us to look at the scriptures, dive deep into the scriptures, and see how has God revealed himself. My name is Tony Alonzo. I am the pastor of C3. And we are excited that you are continuing to journey with us through this series. So let's go ahead and dive in and let's see what God's word has for us as we seek to understand that God is perfect. Before we get started though, real quick, if you do not have the Knowing the Living God Bible study, you can purchase it on Amazon. It's called Knowing the Living God by Paul Washer. You can get it on Kindle. And if you do not have it, you can just follow along right over here to uh, my left hand side. I guess if you're watching, it'd be your right hand side, wouldn't it? Maybe. And if you are do or excuse me, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up because you can follow along with us. Now we're going to be using the New American Standard Bible because that is what this particular study was written in. So if you have that version of the Bible, it'll just be a little easier to follow along. If you don't have one handy, that's okay. We got ours right here that you can follow along as well. So without further ado, let's jump into chapter 9, God is Perfect from Knowing the Living God Workbook. So let's see what it says. It says, the scripture teach us that God is perfect and lacks nothing in his person or works. There is no possibility of a defect in God. The perfection of God has some very important implications. First, it assures us that God will not change. He cannot become better than he is because he is already perfect. And he cannot become less because he would then cease to be God. And secondly, it assures us that God is worthy of our absolute trust. Now, this is a very big thing that is being brought before us today. If God is perfect, what does that mean? If God does not change, what does that mean? If he never can become less than what he is, what hope, what comfort, and what does that help us with as we're journeying through scripture and as we're frankly journeying through life? As we're continuing to now, things have changed from COVID-19 uh, to racial reconciliations to peaceful protests to riots and all sorts of things have been going on during the recordings of these videos. And we see all sorts of chaos and turmoil at the time of these recordings. And so... If you are watching this at a later day, just go back to 2020 and you'll see all the things that are happening. Uh, this will go down in history and will be taught in the history books and in schools and in churches for years and years to come. And so what we need to do, especially in this particular day and age, is we need something that we can hold on to, something that is true, something that is solid, something that is a rock, that is immovable. And the perfectness of God is that. Let's continue. The works of God are perfect. God is perfect in every aspect of his character. The works of God being an extension of his character are also perfect. The implications of this truth are tremendous and should produce in us a confidence that will prevail, prevail against the greatest doubts. And that is exactly what I just spoke of. This understanding of God, and as we understand fuller who God is, it will provide that firm foundation as we go through this rocky and turmoil time. All that God has ever done or will ever do in the universe and in each of us is perfect. That is an incredible statement. But is it true? Because we can say things all we want. But whether something is true or not is based on if we discover it in God's word. 
So what do the following scriptures teach us about the perfection of God's work? So first we're looking at God's work. And what does these scriptures tell us? So Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, verse 3 and 4. So we're in Deuteronomy actually right now. So let me jump up here to verse 3 and 4. And so Deuteronomy 32, chapter uh, 32, verse 3 says this. For I proclaim the name of the Lord and ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, his work is perfect for all of his ways are just a God of faithfulness and without injustice righteous and upright is he now if you haven't been journeying with us and you just happen to to peek in at this one you may say okay well that's great uh, a verse in the Bible says God is perfect well we have to understand our understanding of the Bible and that God's word, the scriptures, is God's revealed wisdom to us through human author, but empowered by the Holy Spirit so that the Bible is inerrant and infallible in its original writings. So that's why we can trust the Bible. So when the Bible says that he is the rock and that his work is perfect, then we can trust that his work is perfect. And that brings us great comfort. Let's look at Psalm 18, verse 30. Psalm 18, verse 30. And you may hear uh, roosters crowing in the background. So uh, our roosters that we've gotten a few weeks ago are now old enough that they are doing uh, their rooster crows. So if one gets close to the door and you hear a rooster crow, uh, that's just how we roll around here. So you'll just have to uh, uh, ignore that and keep moving in. So Psalm uh, 18, verse 30 says this, As for God, his ways are blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all of those who take refuge in him. A great comforting verse. But let's look at our notes here below, off to the side, and let's see what that means. In our notes it says the word blameless comes from a Hebrew word which may also be translated as perfect. It is important to note that there is a direct relationship between God's character, his works, and his word. Because God's character is perfect, his ways and word are also perfect. Let's move on to the next page and let's look at Ecclesiastes. And chapter 3, verse 14. It says this, I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it and there is nothing to take away from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him. And our note says the completeness or perfection of God's work should lead us to a fear or a reverence of him. And again, we don't have time to unpack fear, uh, but in our American Western con uh, context, we hear fear as something that we are scared and afraid of and run from. And this is something, this understanding of biblical fear is different. It should cause us uh, to be scared and afraid, but in awe and wonder of who this God is because this God is so much more powerful, mighty, wonderful than we are, so other than holy and different than we are, then because of we, when we fully see God as he is, it produces a fear in us, but a biblical, a reverence of him. Let's go to number two. God works not only in his creation, but also in his people. Every Christian is a work of God. And what do the following scriptures teach us about this truth? Let's go ahead and look at it right now. Ephesians 2, 10. I love this verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so what does the following scriptures teach us about God's work in his creation, but also in his people? We see that we are considered his workmanship. So not only does God work in everything and in, in creation and uh, the trees and the plants and the animals, but he works in us and we are his workmanship. Let's now look over here at Philippians and we know his workmanship is perfect. So... We see Philippians 2.13, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 
And that's something that we don't have time to, to really get in because that's not the point of what we're looking at this verse for. But man, think about that. For it is God who works in you. That we should be super crazy excited about. That God loves us, cares for us, rescued it, and is still working in us. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. But we also know it's for our good and joy. But God gets great joy and pleasure out of working out his plan, his will in our lives. And so this again shows us that God is actively working in the believer to bring about the good will and pleasure of his plan. And so may that comfort you today that God has not left you, that he has not abandoned you. And even during this time in 2020 that we are going through, God is still here with us and for us and working in us and is still accomplishing his plans. Let's keep going in Philippians chapter 1. Now we're going to go to verse 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so we see that God is continuing to work and is going to perfect it, and his plans cannot be thwarted. He is perfect. His works are perfect, and those perfect works are aimed and directed at you, in you, and through you. Amen. Like, amen, right? I mean, grasp that. Hold on to it. Think about it. Feel it. Meditate on it. The perfect God of the universe is working in you, through you, for you, and in course for his good joy, will, and pleasure. And this is awesome. All right, let's keep going. If you can't tell, I love the attributes of God. I mean, they are so encouraging, and I hope they are for you today as well. Number three now, number three. The God of all creation is working in the life of every Christian. His work is perfect and will be accomplished without fail. This truth goes beyond what the human mind can comprehend. The perfect God is doing a perfect work in us to make us perfect. According to the following scriptures, how should we respond to this truth? So now we know that God is working in us. We know his perfect will is being accomplished in us and that we are considered his workmanship. Now, the question is, now that we've seen that truth, now let's see the truth of how we respond to that. We're going to start by looking at Psalm 92.4. Psalm 92 verse 4. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. Now here is our response. I will sing for joy at the works of your hand. And you may uh, think about the song, uh, the contemporary Christian song that has that line in it. And so we are to sing out his praises. When we sing, we sing with joy. We sing with excitement. Uh, we sing with the understanding of great satisfaction in what we're talking about. Now, oftentimes in our culture today, it's talking about a woman or a man or a relationship or something we get to do. And uh, of course, you listen to country music, then you can hear all all sorts of different uh, understandings and ideas of, of what great joy is in that lifestyle. And if you hear rap music, you'll hear a different culture and context and pop and top 40, a different culture and context. But what is being said here is that we are to sing for joy. Why though? What's the context of these songs that are different from uh, American top uh, 40, Billboard Hot 100, uh, country, hip hop, all the different genres of music that are out there. What's the difference for the Christian? The Christian will sing for joy at the works of your hand. I think it's Shout to the Lord. I think it is. I think it's Shout to the Lord is the song that also references this. Many others do too. All right, so we sing. What, what else do we do? Psalm 107, 22. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. So again, singing is a big deal, obviously, in this because we sing praise, we sing worship. Singing is something that is an outpouring of us, but we also tell. We also tell of his works. We speak of his works because of what he has done. We not only sing of his works, but we tell of his works in us. His work is perfect, and we need to proclaim that uh, with our mouth. Let's go ahead and look at Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Philippians 2, 12 through 13 says this, both verses. So then my beloved, which is dearly loved. We got to go over that recently in our uh, Sunday sermons. So then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, 
not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work out for his good pleasure. So we already talked about that verse. Now we're jumping up and adding to that. And our note says, as believers, we are not to work for our salvation. Hear this. This is so important. You are not saved by works. It is by grace through faith, and that is a gift from God. We often get confused about faith because we know that we get to participate in our faith while forgetting that Hebrews says that Jesus is the author, the creator, the author, and the finisher of our faith, which is why even our faith is a gift of God. So we are not to work for our salvation, but we are to work out our salvation. We are to live out our Christian lives with a biblical reverence and truth in God. The word trembling possibly notes both the seriousness of the Christian life and the need for humility that leads us to distrust our own power and wisdom and to live dependent upon God. And so that's what we are called to. We are called to sing, we are called to speak forth, and we are called to live in light of who God is and His perfect work. So now that we've seen that, uh, let's keep going. The will of God is perfect. So we see the works of God is perfect. The will of God is perfect. So the will of God is perfect because it is founded upon His perfect and most holy character. It is who He is. It is the attribute of Himself. The implications of this truth are tremendous. God's purpose and plan for us is worthy of absolute trust. We should never lean upon our own understanding or seek to do that which is only right in our own eyes. Rather, we should trust in God and obey His word, the Holy Scriptures. Okay, so let's see this. How is the will of God described in Romans 12, 2? So we're going to go here. We're going to jump over now to Romans 12, 2, and we're going to see these words. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so we see here at the very beginning in A, if you're looking up here and following along, good. The word is translated from a Greek word and refers to that which is good, profitable, and upright. So the will of God is good. The will of God is also acceptable. The word is translated uh, from the Greek word that refers to that which is well-pleasing, approved, or acceptable. And so God is good, it is acceptable, it is well-pleasing, it is approved. And also we see it is perfect. And that word translated from the Greek refers to that which is complete. And hear this, lacking in nothing. That is perfection. And so then how should we describe or how should the description of God's will in Romans 12 too motivate us to live a life of obedience to the will of God? So how then should knowing God's will is good, it is acceptable, and it is perfect, how should that motivate us to live? Well, I mean, if we know that our purpose on this earth is to glorify God and we are to be followers of God and that because we have been rescued, ransomed, restored, and redeemed in Christ, then we are able to then know and live knowing that God's will for us and his working for us is good. It is acceptable. It is perfect. And therefore, we look at God's word and we live according to what he has called us to do. Because anything outside of that, is not perfect but anything within that is perfection and exactly why god has called us to live in that light the perfect life so number two let's keep going the following scriptures give us insight regarding how to respond appropriately to the good acceptable and pleasing will of god let's read the text and write our thought so these scriptures are going to give us insight in how we are to respond so let's go to matthew 6 Matthew 6 and then 9 through 10. So how do we respond? Pray then. In this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now many of you know this and even by heart because it's the Lord's Prayer. 
but it's good to see this because it gives us the insight on how we are to respond appropriately to the good and acceptable, pleasing will of God. We respond appropriately by praying and we pray God's will. And so we pray that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So one thing that we can start doing right now, right away is begin by praying for God's will to be done and joining in, participating in that action of prayer, participating in bringing forth his will, joining in on the purpose to accomplish the will of God that we get to be a part of. And now I've shared this before, God is going to accomplish his will with or without you. But how much amazing is it for you and I to partner with God, to be a part of his kingdom while we are here on earth because that's what we're called to do and it is much better for us it is good for us to follow his perfect will instead of our own imperfect will so according to the following scriptures how should we do the will of god so now that we've seen how to participate so how do we walk in that how do we actually uh put boots on the ground to move forward in this way psalm 48 we will see 48 is I will delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my heart. So we're going to delight to do the will of God because his law, his word, the scriptures are in his heart. So if we're going to do the will of God, guess what? You've got to know your Bible. And so, and I mean this and, and recently, and again, this is something that I don't want to go too far off on, but recently there's been all of this commotion going again. If you were following this live, uh, as the events of 2020 are taking place where, uh, president Trump who held up a Bible in front of a church that was recently burned down because of rioters. And so it was talked about using it as a prop. And there was so much turmoil around the fact that the president is using a Bible as a prop to cater to the Christian base. And so, so many people were yelling and attacking at the president for using it as a prop. However, many Christians today, and almost the majority you could even say, that claim to be Christian uses the Bible as a prop because they never in it. They don't read it. They don't study it. They don't find the great joy in God's word. Like it says here in the Psalm that I will delight in your will because the law is within me. So we, David is delighting in God and God's law is within him. And so many of us do not do that today because the Bible, in a sense, is a prop. It's something we bring to church. It's something we have on a coffee table. It's something we have on the nightstand of our bed because it brings comfort to us to know that we're in proximity of the Bible. But we are not to be in proximity of the Bible. We are to be all up in the Bible. We are to be opening it, studying it, relishing in it, diving into it, looking at it, beholding the beauty and wondrous works of God in it and through it. So the Bible cannot be a prop in our lives. And we can get upset when other people use it as props, as we should, but we are so, so easily deterred by looking at what others are not doing and not focusing in on what are we doing? Are we looking and beholding the wondrous beauty of God? And is it being sustained in us by us looking at it as well and reading it and memorizing it and studying it and knowing how to study it and letting our lives live in light of that? Are we doing that? And I encourage you, let's not use the Bible as a prop. But as Christian, we are used to use the Bible as our only hope. Ephesians 6.6. 6. Not by the way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. And our note says, in the immediate context, Paul is writing about the service that the Christian slaves should render to their masters. However, the truths have a wider application to every area of the believer's life. And so let's move on to see here. How does the life of the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrate a correct attitude and response to the will of God? How should we imitate him? And of course, if you've been walking through as we've been going through Ephesians, we just recently went through uh, the verses that says, be imitators of God. 
And so we are called to. This is something that you and I as believers are supposed to be doing. Though we cannot imitate God, and I use the uh, illustration of be like Mike, Michael Jordan. Though we can't be Michael Jordan on the basketball court, uh, it's not wrong to emulate him and try to be like him. Well, the idea is that we we are not God. We are not little G gods. We are not uh we do not have the attributes. We do not have the incommunicable attributes of God. Therefore, there are things that we cannot do, but there are things that we can do, and those things we are to imitate. So let's look at John 4, 32. I'm going to try to stop from preaching so we can get through this, I promise you. We're, I'm going to work on it. I'm working on it. Here we go. John chapter 4, uh, verse 32 through 34 says these words, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And so the disciples were saying to one another, well, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus responded by saying, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his word. And so what we're doing is how does the life of our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrate the correct attitude and response to the perfect will? Well, Jesus's life, if we look now to Christ instead of ourselves, when we look to Christ, we see the perfect man that lived the perfect life. And he said that his food, like what sustained him, was doing the will of the one who sent, accomplishing the work of God. And so if we are going to be imitators of Christ and imitators of God, then we too need to be a people who are focused on the will of him who sent Jesus and accomplishing the will of God. Let's look at John 5.30. Let's see what that says. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Again, Jesus, though God in flesh, though fully human, but fully God, understood that to live the perfect human life is to put his full trust and hope and security and everything that he does uh, or according to or into the perfect will of the Father. And he demonstrates that over and over, which is why the life of Christ is so important. Uh, recently, I was talking to a gentleman who continued to point back to the cross and to the blood of Jesus. And I said, absolutely, amen, 100%. We should never depart from the beautiful truths of the cross. And if I ever do that, please correct me. But we understand the beauty of the cross when we understand the amazing beauty of who God is and the depths of our sins. And therefore, we can't fully understand the beauty of the cross until we understand the greatness of God, the sinfulness of man. And then we also can see the life of Christ. Because when we look at the life of Christ, then we see what perfection is looking like and we can see that then he is the one worthy of the cross to take our sins upon himself. Because if he was not the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice, which we only know that through the Old Testament, then it doesn't make sense why the cross happened. And so we must never depart from the blood of Jesus, but we also must understand the fullness of the gospel. And the gospel is not less than the blood in any way, shape, or form, but it is very much the blood and what surrounds that, that is the gospel. And the gospel includes the surrounding nature. So let us let us look to that. And so Jesus in his perfect life said, I do nothing on my own intentions as I hear and I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him, the will of the Father, the perfect will that we are looking for. And if God's will is perfect for the Son, then the God or the Father's will is absolutely perfect for you and I. Let's keep going. Number three here. One of the most important truths in Christianity is that the will of God is revealed first and foremost through the Word of God, i.e., an example of the scriptures. Like the will of God, the Word of God is perfect because God is its author and its preserver. What do the following scriptures teach us in regard to this truth and how should we respond? So Psalm 19, 7. There we go. If I can find the 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. 
our notes here, the word perfect is translated from a Hebrew word which denotes that which is perfect, complete, sound, and blameless. The word sure comes from the Hebrew word which denotes that which is confirmed reliable and trustworthy. God's word, because it is God ordained, it is Holy Spirit infused and preserved. It is the perfect revelation of God and which is why we need to look to it with our only hope of life and death here on this earth. Because in God's word, we see the gospel. In God's word, we see Jesus. In God's word, we see the will of God, the perfect truth and who God is by his revealed word. Apart from that, we are using our own fallen and broken uh, sinful minds to try to come up with that which is pure, holy, and sinless. And our minds are not able to do that, which is why we rest on God's word. Many will falsely claim that we worship the scriptures or worship God's word. Absolutely not. We worship the God of the scriptures. And so it's easy for people to look on the outside and say, oh, you Bible thumpers, you care more about God's word than God. That, that's ridiculous. But we do know that it's through God's word that we see the revelation of God. And that's why it is so important. Let's keep going. Uh, Psalm 12, 6. Let's look at that verse right now together. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of the, on the earth refined seven times. Now hear this. So the notes here, the scriptures are absolutely reliable as a means of knowing the will of God. The ancients had a very effective process for refining or purifying silver. Hear this. It was melted down with intense heat and then the impurities would rise to the surface and be removed. To say that the word of God is like silver refined seven times communicates this. It's absolute purity. By extension, it's reliability. And so hear that. That's why the word of God, it is pure, it is true, it is holy, it is righteous, it is altogether wonderful. And that's why we look to it, because it's in the word of God that we see the revelation of the perfect God. Let's continue. Second Timothy. And this is something that I was talking about just recently as well, and it's so important. All scriptures is inspired by God. All scriptures are profitable for teaching. It's not just one section of the Bible that we look at, but we look at the full counsel of God because it's there for reproof, correction, training, and righteousness so that man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We must know the scriptures and the fullness of scriptures, and we must look to the wholeness of scriptures. And so we do that. Um, by looking at scripture as a whole, look at our notes. The word inspired comes from the Greek word theanustas, which is literally translated God breathed. The scriptures are an absolute reliable witness to the will of God because they proceed out of the mouth of God. I mean, there we have it. All right, let's keep going. We're almost there. We're almost there. Number four. All right. The word of God is the primary means through which the will of God is revealed. According to the following scriptures, what should be our attitude and response to this truth? All right, let's look at it. Psalm 1, 1 through 2 says this. Here we go. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sits on the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. And so the word being the primary means through which is the will of God revealed. And so according to this, what should our attitude and response be? We meditate on his laws day and night. We delight in his law. We can't just have a Bible that collects dust. That is, that is unknown to the believer. That is unknown to the Christian. We can't just watch videos of people preaching. We can't just show up on Sunday mornings and hear me preach God's word. That is not enough. We must delight in it. We must meditate on it day and night. Church is not a Sunday only thing and then continue about. But we need to be looking forward to God's word day and night 
delighting in it, finding great joy in it. Because we see how God has rescued, ransomed, restored, and redeemed a people for his glory and our good and joy. Let's keep going. Psalm, we're going to stay in the Psalms. 119, verse 47 through 48. I shall delight in your commandments, which I love. And I shall lift up my hands to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statures. I mean, do you hear these words? Are you reading them with me? Are you seeing the great joy that is coming from God's word? I mean, we are going to the scriptures because there holds the truth. And we're seeing that the scriptures are not just something that we just do and drudge through. And like, oh, I got to give my Bible reading today. Oh, I've got to open up God's word today. Oh, I know I should. And I'm being being guilted into it. Man, if you're being guilted into it, you're not reading and then seeing. You don't have eyes to see what is being revealed to you because it is the greatest story of all time. And it is a story about reality. And it is a story about you and I and our response to it because ultimately the Bible is a story about God and points us to him. And we are the recipients of God's grace and mercy to him be the glory of that. And so I hope that hearing these words generate an excitement in you to also see what is held here in the scriptures. All right, Psalm 119, we're going to stick here in 119. And now we're going to go to 127 through 128. And it says this, therefore, I love your commandments. I get, I mean, hear these words. I mean, just stop. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm getting a little excited here. Hear this, because this is so anti-American, what I'm about to say here. This is craziness. Are you ready? Therefore, I love your commandments above gold. Yes, above fine gold. Who on this earth says this stuff? Who says this? No, we're talking about the American dream. That is work as hard as you can, get as much money as you can, retire on the beach in clear water, have your boat, collect shells, do, do all of this stuff. This is what we are designed to do is to gather as much so that we can then have plenty and then just relax and enjoy whatever time we have left. But look what the scriptures reveal to us. Therefore, I love your commandments. Where are his commandments? His commandments are found in the word of God. And then he says, yes, I love them above gold and even fine gold. Therefore, I esteem right all your precepts concerning everything. And I hate every false way. Hear these words because he knows that God is perfect because he knows the truth revealed in God's word. Therefore, he says, not only is it better than all gold, but he esteems them right because for their precepts concerning everything. Because everything, they are right. And because he hates everything false, anything that's not this is false. All right, 127, 128. All right, looks like we're down to our final two. Let's keep going. Ezra 710, almost there. Here we go. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of God, the law of the Lord, and to practice it and to teach his statues and the ordinances in Israel. And so here we see what Ezra is doing is he's studying God's word, but he's not just studying it. He's not just learning it. And hear this, God's word is perfect. And it's not just to soak it in, but it's actually to go now do it. We can't just sit here and read God's word and, and soak on it and then not be changed and affected by it. We must go and walk in this light, which is what Ephesians 4 and 5 that we're going through as a church is talking about, is because of chapters 1 through 3 is the gospel. When we understand the gospel, when we're transformed by the gospel, then we go and walk in light of the gospel. And so Ezra set his heart to study out God's word, and then he went and practiced it. But guess what? He didn't even stop there. What did he continue to do? He said, and then to teach his statues and ordinances in Israel. You are called to not just delight in the word of God, but to walk in that. And then guess what? You are called to be discipled. You're called to be trained up. You're called to learn and to soak in God's word. So not only that you can live it, but now that you can go and teach it. And so let's look at the last verse here. We're heading back to 2 Timothy now we're going to go to 2.15. It says this. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, 
accurately handling the word of truth. Now this, I need to pause on just a moment. This is the great need for all of us as believers, is we must be trained up in the Word of God. You say, well, I can just open up God's Word and I can just read it. Yes, you can. But the understanding is, is that we are to be discipled. The Bible says in the Great Commission, Jesus is saying, go there and make disciples. It means we are to be trained up by someone so that we can then go out and be training up other people. The idea is if we just open up God's word, can the Holy Spirit still work through that? Absolutely. But we can often be confused because if we don't know how to study God's word, if we don't understand the type of writings they are, are they letters, are they prophecies, uh, are they gospels, are they revelations, or what, what, is, what are we reading here? Then how do we understand the context? So many believers today are just ripping out a verse here and are ripping out a verse there and are not looking at the context. And if we don't or if we're not trained in how to read the Bible and we're not trained with what we're to be looking for, if you're not being actively discipled and you're not following along like Bible studies and so forth, then you're not being trained up and equipped because it says this, be diligent. This is something you are called to do. Paul is telling Timothy to be diligent, to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed because why? Because he's accurately handling the word of truth. Every believer, while this is being sent to Paul, or from Paul to Timothy, who is going to be the pastor of Ephesus, the church there, this is the call to every believer that is going to be discipling another believer, is they are to accurately handle God's word. You can't accurately handle God's word if you're not being discipled and trained and raised up. Therefore, you can deceive other people. And that is a horrible thing. James 3, 1, not many of you should be teachers because you will be judged stricter. So we need to be careful and remind that. Now, while I believe that is a call to pastors, however, we must be very careful with what we are doing when we're teaching and discipling others. We are called to disciple, but we are also called to rightly handle God's word. Why? Why? Let's wrap it all back around. Because God is perfect. God's word is perfect. God is infallible. And because God is perfect, we can rest fully in God's perfection. Because his word is perfect, we can rest in God's word for our life and walk in that light. But then as we teach others, we need to make sure we're teaching God's word as it has been revealed and not what we think it means. Because when we start inputting our own thoughts that are outside of the context of what is being shared then we are taking what is perfect and then we are sharing what is imperfect and get this, we are then passing it off as if it were perfect. How dangerous is that? So this is a call today as believers in Christ. It's a call to do a couple of things here. We are called to rest, rest in God being perfect because you're not, you can't be. You are a fallen, broken from the seed of Adam. By your nature, you are children of wrath. And therefore, if you rest on yourself, you are resting in something that is going to lead to eternal damnation. But we rest in God. And so you are called to rest in God. He is perfect. We are not. Put our faith and hope in that which is perfect. Secondly, we are called to find out about this hope that we have through the perfect revealed word of God. God's word is perfect. Therefore, we rest in him as he has been revealed through God's word, the scriptures. We don't rest in a God that we have created in our own mind. We do not rest in a God that is proclaimed by other people. We rest in the God of the scriptures and his perfect word. And then we walk in light of that because of God's perfect perfectness and because of his perfect word we walk in light of that teaching then others God's perfect word as revealed through the scriptures taken in context and rightly divided and rightly handled 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 that's a word maybe but rightly handled 
And so that is the call to every believer that is watching this and every believer of every generation, of every skin, of every culture, of every tongue, of everything. If you are a believer in Christ, you are called to this. Now let us walk in this manner, in this light, according to this knowledge that God is perfect. Well, God bless you guys. Next week, we will be back to look at God is eternal. And what great news that is for us as believers. Uh, be sure to follow us on social media. Uh, Facebook.com slash this is C3. Uh, Instagram.com slash this is C3. The letter C, the number three. Uh, YouTube, subscribe to our channel at YouTube.com slash this is C3. Letter C, the number three. And you can go to our website at www.thisisc3.com. If you want to help keep videos like this going, you can also give to the ministry. You can do that by going to our website at www.thisisc3.com slash giving. God bless you all and can't wait to see you back next week as we continue our study of knowing the living God. We'll see you real soon.